Hello and welcome to episode number 254 of the Armin Show podcast, where anything can happen, and it's a great show. On this episode, we have Dr. John Marsloff, author of In Search of Meadow Larks, Birds, Farms, and Food in Harmony with the Land. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Armin. Great to be here. This is a wonderful thing. Now, um, I would like to preface this element of the show. There's an epidemic across the earth. We are all impacted by it. Uh, across you're in Washington, I'm in California, all the different countries. It slows down our earth a little bit, so it causes us to take a deeper look at our own house, our family, and what we have around us, which also connects to farms, food, what we take in. These are all slowed down things. They're not like uh, instant stock trading or something like that. What led you into the category of this book that you have written about? Well, a couple of things. I'm, I've been interested in birds for a long time and have, have done lots of work there, not so much in farm country, but in and around it. And it was kind of a natural extension to see how birds were doing in those sorts of lands, as well as the more urban lands that I've worked in and, and wilder places I've been. And also my, my daughter is a farmer. And so I was naturally interested in how things were going uh, where she was working and how the sorts of activities they did affected the birds and other natural processes. Mm -hmm. Your daughter's a farmer. Now, how early on did you first look at a bird with interest more so than the average person? Probably not until high school. I had a fabulous high school teacher that got me excited about lots of things in nature, snakes, mammals, and birds. Mm -hmm. And we started collecting data on birds, looking at hawks and where they nested in western Kansas or great blue herons and um, surveying their colonies across the state. So from a more scientific standpoint, I'd say then. But I was always interested in them as a hunter with my dad uh, earlier. And just as a person who liked to be outside and birds are, you know, kind of a omnipresent signal to us while we're out there to, to brighten the day. Mm -hmm. This is true. I was in New York not too long ago for the first time and Central Park. There's yeah. a, something online dedicated to the birds there. They have some interesting birds in there. To yeah, the my last book, I went to Central Park and I uh, actually saw more, more birds there than in Yellowstone. So it's well, quite a spot. Huh. This is true. Now, how important are birds as a representation of, well, what do they represent for us? They're a very visible aspect of biological diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not the most diverse group of organisms, certainly some of the smaller microbes and insects, much more diverse, but birds are what we see and encounter daily. They not only inspire us and, and intrigue us, but they perform Im important ecosystem services, such as pollinating and dispersing seeds and uh, controlling pests, which was an important aspect of what I saw them doing on some of the farms I visited. Mm -hmm. Speaking of pests, has there been a reduction of insects across the planet based on humans and their activities? or is it increasing in some areas and completely decreasing in other areas? I would say there's, like with, with almost all elements of the natural world, there's been a general reduction, but also a, a big shift in terms of the composition of what remains with us. Because some organisms, whether they're insects or birds or, or mammals, they do very well with us and mm -hmm. others don't. So we see probably an overall reduction in diversity, but maybe an increase in abundance, especially of some species that thrive on our activities or our, our uh, crops and uh, homes and become pests to us. Mm -hmm. Now, for the average individual, what are the most important elements of farming to take into account today? What should we be worried about in the next five to 10 years? Well, I guess a couple of things. One, uh, can our farms have enough food with uh, challenges from uh, global climate change? And, uh, you know, over the short term, five or 10 years, that's, that's not really a, a question 
so much as it is over the next 50 to 100 years. And there's been a lot of work done on trying to understand how farm productivity can increase, how waste can decrease, how transportation can make food more justly available to people uh, in this, you know, over, over the next century, let's say, when human populations are projected to increase dramatically and our affluence and therefore craving of uh, things in our diet like meat will increase dramatically. So those will be some challenges in the not immediate short term, but sort, certainly uh, in the lifetime of, of some people uh, alive today. And then dealing with uh, bird responses and um, how natural features of the environment can be maintained on farms, I think the one very important thing to ask is, is do we basically intensify farms and reserve areas outside of farms for nature? Or do we try to have a little bit of both on our farms, food production and natural production? Is there a good percentage cutoff for those two? That's a good question. I would say uh, no. There are certainly some species that absolutely require reserves. And so we need to have some areas set aside for reserves. Some people would suggest 50% of earth should be reserved. And sure, if we want to really conserve all of our rare biological diversity, that would be great. It's not practical, unfortunately, given how much we've already utilized and, and the needs increasing in the next half to full century, like I, I just mentioned. So how to, how to shape that? Difficult to say, but um, certainly some reserves uh, in each of our different important uh, land cover types or our ecosystems. And then within the farms and cities, but I consider them both, you know, very important human areas. We mm -hmm. need to see how we can share those with nature as well. So I would say do as much as possible as practical on, on both cases. One thing I noticed, well, there's a few things that came to mind as I was reading Let's say there's a person who is vegan and composts and if someone watches everything they're eating, takes into account these details and everybody was doing that, how quickly would that alter any issue coming up in the next 10, 20 years? It would alter dramatically. Uh, there have been some nice simulation studies done that show that those issues of conserving diversity of uh, biological uh, features as well as feeding the population. There are a lot of options available if we were all vegans. That would be um, the easiest thing for the world to deal with in terms of feeding everybody and conserving nature. So it's not so much how quickly, but it's how many different options we have available to us to organize land for conservation and for production. And the more people that eat less meat, uh, the, the more options we have at our disposal. That makes sense. There might be a time possibly in the future where it'll be nearly required to stick to something like rice and beans or simpler things. Is that possible? Perhaps, or I would even say it's going to be more creative. I mean, look at what we're already seeing. You can go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and get Impossible Chicken or That's Burger true. King and get an Impossible Whopper. Right. You couldn't even get an Impossible Whopper when I was writing this book. You had to go to special burger places to, to get that. So options like that, I think those are exciting. And um, they're things that are going to just make that transition if we decide to go that way as a society, a lot easier and a lot more tasty. Well, that's true. I think that one was biased from my own perspective. I don't really have a high descriptiveness or taste for food that's so necessary. So if I had to eat tofu, rice, and beans for a few years, I probably could do it pretty easily. But for most yeah. people, that would be a large shift. And so things that are more flavorful or similar might be appealing. Now, one thing that is very notable that I noticed in the book, I want to get back to the birds too, but also, the, the farms across the United States especially have been subsidized towards uh, corn and soybeans. And does that shift back to a more normal representation of farming at some point, or is that pretty set in stone at this time? Well, the way our government subsidies are set up, that's set in stone right now. I would hope that that's something we could change uh, rather quickly in the future because 
that's driving an awful lot of, of the damage we're doing to the ecology of our, uh, of our country and, and other places in the world. And um, the more that's looked at, the more damages that are seen. I mean, even just the dust of the harvest of these things is now being found to profoundly affect human health. So the more diverse small scale farming that was practiced in the past, the more we can embrace that sort of approach to the land, uh, the softer it is on the land, the easier it is on the people that live there and the farmers that work there as well. But with government subsidizing uh, big crops uh, for non-food purposes, so corn going and soy going mainly for either cattle feed or for ethanol production, not food. Um, that's driving the farm market because farmers have to make a living and, and they have to do what is um, economically beneficial for them in many cases. So um, if, if government provides that incentive, farmers follow. If government would provide the incentive for conservation and food production, um, farmers would follow that as well. That's true. The incentives are a big deal. You mentioned that in the book, and incentive guides so much of what we do because there's so little that we do just out of our own accord we usually follow what's the what makes sense in a practical form yeah. it's not the most practical but practical based on the guidelines sent to you yeah what uh what would the percentages of corn and or soybeans be compared to what they are now if it was normal and not subsidized well i think we eat something like two percent of the corn that's produced uh, and so it could be dramatically reduced. Um, there are better ways to get fuel. Um, mm -hmm. And as those technologies develop, batteries become uh, more feasible and we rely less upon um, some sort of biofuel uh, to power our vehicles and industry. Um, there, th that option will be much, much more appealing. And we can use a lot less land to grow the the crops we need if we're going to eat them directly. Um, if we still want to have um, animal products in our diet, which, you know, I, I'm not a vegan. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a vegetarian. I enjoy a diversity of foods. Right. Then um, we need to also have some pasture available for animals to graze on. And that's much less ecologically damaging than growing crops to feed them in a different place. So how, how that balance comes out in actual percentages, um, I don't know, but it's a heck of a lot less than it is now. I mean, like much more than half of what we utilize now for production of, of cow food and fuel would be necessary uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, returning to the title of the book, In Search of Meadow Larks, why specifically were meadow larks chosen for the title? It could have been egrets or herons. And do you have a favorite bird as well? Yeah, great question. You know, and that title, like a lot of them, kind of comes out as you get deep into the book. I was focused more on harmony as I was working on the book, mm -hmm. but uh, meadowlarks were a recurrent theme, and they're a species that's emblematic of the decline of grassland birds across the world, and, and especially in the U.S. But the, that group of birds, those that use grasslands to feed in and especially to breed in, have been greatly reduced because most of our grassland worldwide has been converted to agriculture. So the metal arc, I think, is a good species for that. It could have been uh, some, some other grassland birds in other places around the world, more than a, a waterfowl, for example, an egret or a heron, which um, because of a lot of our conservation efforts, that group of birds is, is actually doing relatively well. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't have said that 20 years ago, but now, now we can. So um, I think the metal arc's a good choice for that. As far as a favorite bird goes for me, <clears throat> that's always a hard question. I like a lot of birds, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I love metal arcs, I always have as, as growing up with them. But I guess really my heart is with ravens and crows, where I, I've done a lot of my work and I'm, I'm doing research now on ravens. So they always have commanded a special place with me. That makes sense. They're very uh, representative. I remember some, I think it was computer games in the 90s or certain movies, Ravens are used as a, they have a message. What, yeah, what is, when you go do research or you're in the field, what are some of the main things you are currently doing or have done in recent years? 
So with respect to uh, things I've, I've done, I, we did a long-term study of um, how birds respond to suburban development here in the Seattle area. And um, here we're converting our forests into more open places where houses exist. And as a result, the types of birds we see here has changed dramatically. Many have decreased, but a lot have increased as well. And we have new species around that are coming from California, for example, where you're from. Mm -hmm. uh, the Anna's hummingbird out my window here um, didn't used to exist here right. and certainly didn't exist year round here like it does now. So that's been an important theme. And, and another part of my work has been looking at how humans really co-evolve with birds and how, how they affect us and how we affect them reciprocally. And so work with crows in that respect and how they recognize us and we recognize and respond to them and form these almost domestic relationships with them in some of our cities has been interesting. Mm -hmm. and, and now, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm um, conducting research on ravens, which I've done for on and off for 40 years. And the birds now that I'm looking at live in Yellowstone and I'm heading back there tomorrow to follow up more with them of how they utilize wolves and people for food resources. Speaking of birds and or people, I always like to look at analogs. Have you noticed any similarities in the way that birds work as a group and how humans work as a group or are they completely different? Oh, I think there's some, there's some similarities. Um, we are rather unique in, in making our food and, and you know farming land and mm -hmm. the ability to take a place and make it suitable to us is much different than how animals respond where they usually have to find a place that's suitable and settle there rather than uh, create something de novo like we can do. So, uh, but our social responses are somewhat similar, I, I would say. Um, we're a social group species, we're seeing some of the detriments of that right now with this virus spread, um, you That's know, by, by living closely together, diseases are a, a major problem for us, as well as other animals that live in groups. And the way you reduce that is to spread out the social distancing that we're doing is the same sort of thing that, that other animals will practice to, to reduce um, their um, vulnerability to diseases like that. So I, I think in the, the current example, we're responding like a lot of species would. And I don't think it will drive the evolution of us being asocial right. like it has in some species. But that's a major reason why some species live alone, uh, you know, is to avoid those costs, either being captured more easily as a group or being um, susceptible to diseases. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that too, how we are social creatures and this has a big impact. It's like the opposite of what we're meant to do as social distancing. And then some animals, I think it was foxes, they don't think like us they just think about themselves and they wouldn't even think of the group yeah very very asocial species and there are benefits to that and we're seeing you know in our case right now the costs of being social right it is a heavy impact are there any epidemics that have hit birds at times that have really impacted them across their species well there's been a lot of um epidemics that that have been fostered by human uh, animal interactions and birds play into that for sure. And on farmlands quite a lot, the H1N1 virus that a lot of our responses uh, um, that we're seeing today and the, the um, swine flu, those are response, those are diseases that were in part perpetuated by transmission through wild birds. Uh, it didn't affect the birds as much. The more recent one that's affected birds a lot uh, wild birds, at least, has been West Nile virus, uh, which which killed uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds across uh, the New World, um, starting in the 90s. So, these these sorts of pathogens that come into a new area and or acquire the ability to infect a new host, uh, like like us or birds with West Nile virus. Um, they have dramatic effects. They're, they're, they're ravaging at first and then they attenuate in their strength uh, through time and, and the species come to live with them. Mm -hmm. 
one thing that comes to mind, you're in the Seattle area. I visited Seattle for the first time uh, near the end of last year. It was very nice. And I really like the rain. A lot of individuals, I think it would be found to be somewhat dreary, the area, but yeah. I thought it was refreshing. And But the shortage of, of sun was definitely something to take in. Uh, what are, for for specifically Seattle or Washington, what are some of the important agricultural growths that they have there? and how has that changed in the past 10 years and how will it likely change in the next 10 years? Yeah, uh, good question. I mean, our climate's definitely uh, changing. We're storing less water as snow and more of it's running off. And when it runs off here, it runs off pretty quickly mm -hmm. uh, when it's not stored as snow. Um, our major agricultural products, uh, wheat uh, is a major product across Eastern Washington. Um, Fruit crops, apples and pears, cherries are very important. And uh, wine, grapes are very important. And I would say that one of the changes we're seeing a lot here is an increase in the amount of wine grapes uh, relative to some of these other crops. And, um, and we are um, rivaling California in wine production <laughs> now. So, um, but we have still a pretty diverse agricultural setting, not as diverse as, uh, as you see in the Central Valley or um, in, in other places in California. Ours is mostly those, those crops that are more cold hardy. We don't have a longer growing season that has a lot of vegetable production here mm -hmm. relative to um, California, for example. That makes sense. Now, uh, you're a professor at University of Washington and what are some of the courses you have taught over the years and what do you hope to relay over to your students? Yeah, um, courses I've taught kind of, I'm a professor of wildlife science. So uh, I deal with basic ecology and, and um, evolutionary responses to human activity. And I've taught classes specifically in ornithology, the study of birds, mm -hmm. um, governance of rare and threatened species. So kind of endangered species responses and how um, mainly the Endangered Species Act here deals with that. And then uh, my favorite classes are those that are more field oriented. So I have a class in the spring that uh, unlike this year and in, in other years takes a group to Yellowstone for a week so that students can get some hands-on experience collecting data, uh, observing animals, seeing a diversity of animals there, you know, wolves and grizzly bears that, that we don't see every day here. And um, also then one in Costa Rica. In the, in the summer, we have classes before school starts for students to get experience abroad, mm -hmm. not for a full year, but shorter periods where they can get some experience traveling and seeing the rest of the world. And, and I've been taking a group to Costa Rica for about a decade doing that. And that I think super important for students to understand that you know we're not alone on this planet there's a lot of other people that are doing things differently and for example when we go to costa rica i write about it in the book we see alternative farming systems uh, where people are living much more lightly on their lands using them for diversity of purposes and often you know growing their own or their community's food unlike where you uh, go to a large production farm in the Midwestern US. So for students to see that, see that it works, see how they can participate in it, it's pretty eye-opening, um, I think. And those are the kind of things I like to stress in my classes, you know, what's out there in the natural world, how we can um, take care of it, how we can benefit from it, and um, how other people are doing that, not just how we're doing it here. Mm -hmm. If there was like a set of, let's say three things that the average person in the United States could do as part of their life, one of their maybe atomic habits like that James Clear book, what would be some things they could do that would have a healthy impact on farms and or wildlife? Yeah, I mean, I think the top three that, that most people would suggest would be one, reduce your consumption of grain fed beef for sure. There are other animal products that are less damaging to the environment um, some wild caught fish, some uh, chicken and poultry uh, in general, ev even pork is, is less damaging to the climate and to the landscape 
than is the um, huge demand for crops to feed grain fed cattle. So really moving away from that, whether it's to bison or to chicken or to vegetables completely um, would be one thing. The second thing would be to waste less food. A third of all of our food that's grown is wasted, not just by the consumer, but through the uh, movement of foods to the market. Mm -hmm. So um, basically uh, trying to waste less, buy as much and fix as much as you need, not the extras if you're not going to utilize those. Mm -hmm. And then really being more open, I think, to some of the technologies that allow us to produce more from less land. Mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a hard thing for some people to, to wrap their heads around with the need to gen genetically modify some crops so that they can handle droughts better or use less fertilizer. Those sorts of modifications um, allow us to farm in a more ecologically sensitive way in, in some cases. So there are some downsides to that in terms of big agribusiness, you know, kind of controlling everything about the farm. Mm -hmm. But um, there are some really important ecological benefits that can come from um, managing these crops in a different way. And that might include managing their genomes. So being open to that, I think is important. So those three things would, would be the first ones I would do. And, and you could also summarize those by saying, it's just really important to know your farmer. And if you can meet your farmers uh, at, at um, farm, um, what am I trying to think of? Farmer's uh, markets? No. Farmer's markets, thank yeah. you. <laughs> That's the best place to do it. Uh, otherwise, some stores will post, you know, little placards about the farmers, but get to know them at farmer's markets. So you can ask them, like, what do you do for habitat on your land? Do you, uh, do you kill predators? All kinds of different things can come up uh, in a conversation. And I think you'll, you'll find farmers enjoyable and really wanting and trying to do the right thing whenever they can. So, uh, but knowing their applications and how those align with your uh, values is a, is a good way to decide, you know, what, what to eat and what not to. This is true. One way I kind of think about that is uh, it's sort of desirable at times. It feels maybe cool to disconnect from the practical reality and jump into things that are more technologically advanced or it seems to be fast moving. But then as we see in a time like this, when there's an epidemic, suddenly everything goes back to the basic things and can you keep clean and can people transfer things to you? So yeah. therefore it's almost like it's beneficial to connect directly with a farmer or get to know the food you're eating and how it's created. And you can still set aside time to do, you know, high tech. This is high tech right now. What we're doing in a way, direct video conferencing and it doesn't take away from the practical is always still there. I always think of it as like a base and then the network is on top of the base. Without the base, the network breaks down completely. One thing I wanted to point out, back in episode 204, I had a guest, Simone Albuquerque. She was a, she is a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz and is the person I thought of when I was reading her book because she studies sustainable farming, ecology, and water management. One element we've not mentioned yet was water management. Is that an issue in Seattle or not so much? Well, I mean, I think water management's an issue everywhere. It's less of an issue, certainly here in Seattle. Mm -hmm. um, where I came to it uh, in, in writing this book was in wheat farming. And one of the farms that I often stop by on my travels uh, is a big wheat farm. And I had been reading about wheat farming as being one of the worst uh, examples of drawing water tables down. And the drawing of water tables down in California in the Midwestern US and around the world, especially in uh, Iran, Iraq, places like that, um, that's a huge uh, effect of agriculture that will have long lasting effects, not only on wildlife, but on our ability to, to have water to drink. So I was curious how it played out on, in this wheat farm. And as it turned out, um, they actually don't irrigate. They, so they're not drawing down water tables, but they have to rest the land every three years, not not uh, plant a given section so that it can accumulate water for that extra year. And then they use that in what's called dry land farming. And they basically just go with the water that comes down that year and the previous year that they've stored in the soil to grow the wheat crop. 
And I was, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a farmer. So learning that stuff, which is basic to farmers, to me was really interesting. And it's like, oh, well, that's a way to really, you know, live in harmony with the land. Just, they have to. It wasn't, you know, uh, they weren't thinking of it as a way to reduce water usage. It was just like, there's no other way to grow crops here. And yet it works pretty well with the environment. Uh, and it supports other animals that are on those fields when they're not farming them. So it had a lot of trickle down effects to the, to the natural environment. Mm. On that topic, by the way, how, how difficult is it to farm for a season and then completely replenish every single nutrient that would be in the dirt naturally and then continue forward? Well, it, it's not hard if you, if you don't till and if you um, fallow some land. You don't have to do all of your land every year. So, you know, what a farmer does, they have to have more land so they can put some into production and leave some fallow. Mm -hmm. uh, each year and then they just rotate which which fields they're working mm. and I saw that on many of the farms I went to it's very common on some of the smaller organic farms and to me that's really one of the most important things they could do for wildlife is just give the land a rest uh, in some years and a lot of animals use that and as long as it's moving around on the land birds at least which are pretty mobile can track those movements and and find the place where grass is left to grow that year and they can breed, for example. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's something that a lot of farmers practice, regenerative agriculture, to build the carbon uh, content of their soils by composting, by not tilling, and by fallowing from year to year. Um, that all works to build the health of the soil, nutrients as well as, uh, as the um, structure of the soil. Mm -hmm. And then in relation to that, how, how useful is or will be indoor farming or like stories or floors of just farmland? Is that a worthwhile or a large scale solution or is that a additional maybe assistance? It's going to require more energy input in, in some ways to do that sort of thing, uh, I would think. But this is, again, we're keeping your mind open to some of these technological advances. Um, to me, it sounds crazy to try that on a large scale now, but heck, you know, who knows? And in 30, 40, 50 years, it, it might just be great. They might've figured out excellent ways to do that. Uh, but typically when we go inside with, with crops and things now, it's a lot more energy intensive. And as long as our energy is coming from fossil fuels, that adds to the problem of uh, climate change effects of agriculture. That makes sense. It's a little bit of a slowing down and looking at the things that we have around us. One thing I always like to check, well, two things. One is, do you have any scientists that you follow along or books in the field that you have liked a lot? And I'll leave it first at that one. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, some of the work by, um, by researchers at, at Stanford and, it, and the California system, Claire Crayman has done some great work on agricultural uh, landscapes and how animals and biodiversity respond to that. Um, other work at, at Stanford has been great at demonstrating how different styles of farming affect bird diversity, for example. So um, I think that's, that's really important work. Um, I go through a lot of different scientists that I, that I met with in, in the current book and, and in others as well. And I always find it fun to go out with them and learn about them. I, I, my eyes were really opened by um, some, some researchers at at Humboldt and now at Columbia University that are looking at how owls, barn owls are used in California vineyards to control pests. And I, I wasn't aware of that. And I, as I learned from them, there are thousands of barn owl boxes that, that viticulturists put up in their vineyards uh, to control rodents. And mm -hmm. I was able to go out with, with Matt Johnson and, and others to, to learn about that. So I think just, you know, again, broadening your perspective on the sorts of science that's being done out there um, has been super interesting to me. As far mm -hmm. as books, I look at my shelf here, um, you know, Dave Montgomery, one of my colleagues at the university here has done some good books on uh, restoration 
uh, farming and um, you know, to me, one of the, the most important ones are uh, writings by Aldo Leopold. He was writing, you know, in the 30s and 40s, but his work is, especially with respect to agricultural settings, very relevant still today. And um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say there are, there are lots of, of authors here that have influenced my, my thought, but those guys are pretty important in my mind. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful how sometimes something that's correct on a base level is correct for a hundred years, 200 years, 500 years, thousand, something. That's a really good point. Ago. Yeah. I mean, Leopold, for example, one of his quotes, which I love was uh, he came back to a place where he grew up and used to hunt ducks and things and came back and it was all corn. It's in the Midwest. <laughs> He's like, I like corn, but not that much. <laughs> and it couldn't be more uh, correct today. Uh, he he would be really appalled with how much corn there is. It's right. a lot more than when he was around, but still, you know, it's like too much of one thing uh, usually isn't very good. Right. That's pretty funny. You leave and there's like 15 crops, you come back. Why is this all corn? What is this? Yeah. That's pretty good. Now, um, also, yeah, you mentioned Columbia University. One thing I want to mention is I always value, like you have put in decades into ornithology and analyzing birds. Uh, recently, I uh, spoke with a uh, cancer doctor at Columbia University. She has put decades into specifically a, a specific kind of leukemia, not even the broad leukemia, but a specific kind. And then it makes me think of this one uh, psychiatrist, Stephen C. Hayes. He's put in, let's say, decades into specifically mental well-being in a certain category. I always like that because when you put in that amount of time in a category, you are the person. You represent that. You have a sense of if the bird uh, migration changes, you have a feel for it versus a person that just showed up today, they wouldn't have that sense. They just say, oh, that's just what happens. But you'd be like, oh, no, that's altered because of this, this element, this. this. It's a very nice feature, so it's very valuable. Um, connected to that, but separate. What is one message you would want all people to take away from your work? What would you want them to know? Maybe a sentence or two. Well, I would, I would do this from um, a variety of things I've done, but basically understanding that small things you do can add up to be big differences in the future is important. So we're seeing that with virus now, small things, but uh, the foods you select to eat, where they come from, the things you do in your yard, uh, very small things like reducing grass, keeping mm -hmm. your cat inside, um, eating less grain fed beef, wasting less little things that you think, oh, it doesn't matter what I do. It actually does when millions of people do it. So um, trying to, to set a good example with those things and um, seeing the greater effects of many people doing small things, I think is powerful. We all have an ability here. Yeah. I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the show and bringing forth your knowledge to all of us. You're welcome, Armin. Thanks for doing it. You know it. And we are out.